<laughs> uh, hello, my name is Olga and this is my channel about startups. And today we have a very special guest, Ravi Bilani. Uh, Ravi, thank you for coming. Uh, Ravi is... Happy to be here. Um, Happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Olga. Uh, thank you. Ravi is the CEO and founder of uh, Top B2B Accelerator from Silicon Valley, Alchemist. And I was very happy to be in batch number 26. Um, and Ravi, uh, my audience have so many questions uh, regarding acceleration programs, um, and I will just start right away. So uh, what, uh, what is an accelerator like Alchemist is uh, looking for in startup, startups nowadays? What kind of industries it is interested in? Well, we always first start with the people. So the most exciting companies are not going to be the ones that everybody is talking about, because if you, you know, if there are obviously certain hot topics and in industries like Gen AI or sustainability, which we are interested in, but the most interesting companies are the founders that are thinking differently and doing something that will be disruptive over the next 10 years. So we have a particular, we always first start with the founders and we're first looking for technical founders. So we're all, we only admit teams that have technical, at least some technical co-founders um, as part of it. And then we're looking for companies that are applying a, dis a disruptive technology against a market that we think will warrant the interest of the top venture capital funds. I know that's I'm speaking generically and I'm doing that sort of intentionally because the best if you go after the hot spaces and I can list some of them here, there's a countervailing issue, which is, is that those spaces also have a ton of competition. And so you'll have, especially if founders are just pursuing an idea because I said to build a startup in this area, um, it won't be sustainable. You'll be, you'll be chasing a hot market, um, but that market will also be chased by other founders. And it's a marathon, not a sprint. And over the long haul, you'll likely not be building something that will sustain you or that will be differentiated enough. So we're really most excited about the markets that no one's talking about, you know, and where we have founders that have a unique insight into some problem where they couldn't be generic founders. They couldn't just start any company because they wanted to do a startup, but they could only do this one thing. Um, that's what's so uniquely um, exceptional for us is that when there's a fit between that founder and that problem, having said that, this is a really fun time to be a founder because of so much, so much that's changing. Obviously, everybody knows about sort of what's happening with on the gen AI front. And there are a lot of different verticals that can be attacked with um, gen AI. And we're going to be doing a deeper partnership that we'll be announcing in September for deepening resources around generative AI. Um, and at the same time, I also think there's a lot of opportunities even beyond just generative AI that are being overlooked. Um, so there's lots on, in just AI and machine learning that Gen AI is not necessarily well suited for that um, it is fantastic. And there's a lot on, you know, uh, my heart bleeds for all the founders that are doing something which is um, technically deep and, and, and really true, true, true innovations. So I'm very excited about what's happening right now on space tech, um, on sustainability tech. Um, I'm hoping that quantum computing will have its moments in the next five to six years. It's still early for quantum, but I'm hoping quantum will have its gen AI moment, you know, in five years, just as AI was sort of early three or four years ago. And now everybody's eyes are opening. I think the same will hold true for quantum in five to seven years. Um, and then there's so many things that are happening in emerging markets geopolitically that just building fantastic applications for new markets that are going through hyper growth is, is interesting. Um, and then software is always interesting. So, you know, any, if you, if you, can apply software against the vertical of incumbents that are moving slowly um, and 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 build a, a product that pe people tell where people tell other people about it. That's always great. So I don't. So there's a lot of different verticals that we're excited about. Um, and and uh, I, I guess, again, it goes down to just you individually and also the technical team and mapping that to a problem that you care about. So the team and founders are more important than an idea. Yes. For us, yes. Because the idea can change, the founders can't. Mm -hmm. So even for most seed fund investors, uh, so we're looking for teams. The ideal teams are two technical founders flanking an executioner or a business executioner. There's lots of pattern matching that we have for success with that format. And even if your idea is bad, 
that structure will give you stability um, to find a new idea or to pivot or to innovate. Um, the idea itself, you get some points for, but you get more points for the team and the market. So, so much of success, most, uh, most companies, when they present to us, they're good ideas. We rarely see a company where we think that that's a categorically bad idea. Um, the big issue is timing is why is now the opportunity for this company to actually explode? Um, and that's usually the determining factor between a founder that takes off and a founder doesn't, is the ones that take off get the timing right. That can be because they are building the technologies to control that market and, and driving it forward. And sometimes you just get lucky. You just are in the right space at the right time in a market that's about to open up and explode. So if you can just think carefully about which technical innovations are becoming accessible that change markets in certain ways? Um, and can you use those uh, as a tipping point to go into a new market? It's, there's lots of opportunity. Um, and, and, you know, I think there's lots happening right now with Gen AI libraries that are open and available um, that you can apply to different verticals pretty easily. And that's sort of similar to the iPhone moment. You know, when the iPhone came out, that was sort of like the the, 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 the tech that launched a thousand unicorns, you had Uber and Spotify and Instagram, all these were mobile app first um, billion dollar companies. And at the time, everybody was wondering, can you have a billion dollar company that's not a website? That's just an app. And now we take that as an obvious foregone conclusion. But at the time, it, the, the iPhone was this technology shift that ushered in this new generation of entrepreneurs that were all unicorn founders. And many of those companies weren't technically that difficult. It's not that difficult to build Uber or to build um, even Spotify, you know, so it doesn't have to be technically difficult. So much of it is just mapping a using an existing technology shift and applying that against the market. And then, of course, you can go more technically difficult, too. Mm. Well, sounds promising. Uh, what about um, Alchemist? What does it give to a startup like in terms of network, maybe money, uh, program? Yes. So Alchemist focuses on four elements that we use to measure ourselves by and serving the founders. So it's mentorship, it's fundraising, it's traction, and it's community. And all of these you can do on your own. So it's not like there is a secret that we have, but it really is an acceleration. It really is to um, accelerate your development and learning in a way that would be faster than just doing it on your own. And the truth is, and Olga, you obviously, the best thing is not to listen to me with, with accelerators with, or, or investors, but it's to talk to Olga. It's to talk to other founders that have done the program because founders will be honest with you. And so I say that not just for Alchemist, but even when you fundraise, if you're you know wondering if an investor is good or not, try to ask them to introduce you to other founders they've backed, ideally ones that worked out and ones that failed. And talk to those founders. They'll give you an honest assessment. And the same holds true for accelerators. You should talk to the founders because they'll give you the honest view of what actually the program's like. But the way that we like to think of it as in terms internally is we're focusing on these four things. So what you'll get is you'll get an expert network that you can start to tap into that might be more difficult to get into otherwise. And we do have a Silicon Valley centric network, but it's also fairly global. And you have a lifelong access to an expert network that you can type for, t tap into for advice and coaching. And we'll also be teaching some basics on how to manage and um, execute your goals in a startup environment that may carry forward even post Alchemist. Um, and you have also lifelong access to office hours and, and reaching out to different experts. Even after you're done with the program, you have lifelong access to our expert network. Um, and the mentors, by the way, through Alchemist get equity in you whenever you meet with them who are of a certain tenure, which I think other programs don't do. So, you know, if, if people always ask me what's in it for the mentors, we do allocate um, uh, rewards based on the mentoring. And, and that's also why we also have higher caliber mentors, we, we believe. Um, we have a bunch of mentors that have built businesses worth $100 million or more and, and some that have built unicorns. Um, the second thing that you're going to be getting is, is, is a focus on traction. So Alchemist is different than other programs because we only do enterprise and industrial and infrastructure based startups. We don't do consumer companies and building those companies is completely different. Um, whether you're doing a SaaS app or a dev tools company or a deep tech company or even a health tech company, it's different than a consumer app. And so um, the program is lo longer, it's six months versus most programs are 12 weeks. 
And frankly, you also have time to take more time if you need to um, on that. And all, the focus is all on enterprise focus. The third thing is going to be fundraising. So there is a formal demo day where we have our own network that we will expose to you. And then we also have a bunch of just resources that are available to support fundraising in terms of researching which investors you should be pitching, and then also a network of other found startups that have raised money that we do try to, um, that we that also give advice and feedback and also help sometimes with connections into different people. Um, and then you have lifelong access to that network. So both through the demo day and through our expert network, you can reach out or find different sources of investments. And you can also come back when you're an alum and, and also re, re, re fundraise. And then the final thing, and actually the most important is the community is, I know that's not something that's easy to measure, but the, I think the big value of, of Alchemist and I think other programs is that it can be a lonely pursuit when you're on your own doing a startup. And it's nice to have a network of other founders that understand what you're going through um, that also you can lean on in times when you need support. And Alchemist does have a community of founders that are all trying to change the world. They're all technical. They're all going after um, hard um, enterprise related ventures. And it's nice just to be a part of that community. Sure. And then we do give money. We do yes. give an investment, but it's not a lot. Okay. Yeah. So it's, you know, the, the standard offer is 30,000 US dollars for 5% of equity. And we know that you need a lot more money than that. Um, the, and that, the idea behind the, the standard offer is to offset rent when you're in the program. Alchemist doesn't view itself as an investor. We view ourselves as somebody who can connect you into investors um, later on. And really the equity is for the advisory role in joining the network. Um, and the, um, and the other thing about Alchemist is that we will adjust the economics depending upon the company. So if you are a later stage company, we can, you know, adjust to whatever seems appropriate for you. Uh, that's a discussion. It's not a guarantee, but we are flexible, whereas others aren't. Yeah. And I can, uh, say that these 35,000 was very supportive when we were starting three years ago. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. that really helps. Uh, do you have yeah. any statistics, how many, uh, uh, companies raised during Dima Day? So we need to update our stats. You know, before the economic downturn, it was around 52% would close money within 12 months of demo day. And the median raise of those who closed was, or the, the median raise of those who closed was 2.1 million. Mm -hmm. So it was around 50, a little bit over 50%. It was around $2 million for those who closed capital within 12 months. Mm -hmm. It's gone down just to be transparent after with the economic downturn. And I don't know, I don't want to say the, I don't, I, I think the record, I think it's right now at around 39% of the companies are closing within 12 months, but I, we have to get the formal data and I don't have that. Um, uh, but it's, it's, I think it's directionally around 39%. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, but it might be lower. I have to, I haven't seen the most recent data points. We measure it 12 months out and I have to track the, the data. Okay. Sounds good. And what is the yeah. threshold? How many startups apply? How many get into Alchemist into the batch? Two. So we had 2000 applications apply over the last year. The applications have been going up a lot. So they've been going up 74% year over year. And of those 2000, 60 get admitted. So it's around a 3% admit rate. You know, we actually are doing interviews next week and we had 368 applications for eight we're going to give out eight offers. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's actually gone up a lot in the yeah. last, even this, I think it was it's doubled from last year. So we're trying to, um, you know, we always have this debate if we want to expand the size of the class. And, you know, I think the differentiation of Alchemist versus others is that we do try to keep the class at 20, maybe up to 25 companies. Um, but we're trying to keep it small and intimate so that the companies get all the attention and they don't have to compete with each other. And, you know, you, you, you can get access to anybody that you want to. Um, but it's around 3% admit rate over the last year, and it's probably going to go down to around 2.5%. Yeah, yeah, that's not a lot. <laughs> not a lot, yeah. Huge competition. And uh, do startups have to have traction, or you no. take ideas as well? Nope. You just have to have a team. Mm -hmm. So we, we have admitted companies that have literally started their companies at Alchemist. They've, um, you know, they uh, they... Um, there was a team that we admitted. We've had companies that left Google on Monday and then they joined Alchemist on Thursday and they've been huge successes. And we've also had companies that are 10 years old and have joined Alchemist. And uh, so our, our criteria is based on the people first. So it's always based on the team. And in some ways, it's even best if you are starting early. Uh, 
if you have a great team, because we want to help you and give you the resources sooner than later. Um, you don't need traction. Traction obviously is nice. Also, if you do have it, you want to brag about it because that's differentiating, but you don't need any traction. You just need to have a technical co-founder. So that well, our sacred item is, is that if you don't have a technical co-founder, it's all business teams. It's generally difficult to get um, admitted. Mm -hmm. Do you take solo founders? We have, and we've had, you know, we've had some good success, like with Rigetti, which is a quantum computing company that went public. That was a solo founder. Um, but we, it's a higher bar if you apply on your own. Um, there's, so the reason why is just that it can be a lonely journey on your own. So, and, and it's, a, if you, it's a good test to see if you can convince somebody else to sacrifice their time to work with you on your vision. Um, and, and to go down that journey with you, it's an initial sale in some ways. And it's an evidence that, that people care enough about your conviction to join you. Um, but we don't, it's not a sacred rule. So we have admitted exceptional solo founders and there is an advantage if you are, if you can handle the loneliness of it and you can get to the point where you can find others to join your team, you have advantages as a solo founder because you can give out more equity to your early hires than if you had a co-founder who you're sharing the equity with. So we're not categorical about saying absolutely no, if you don't have a co-founder, but it is harder to get in and we, it, you're scrutinized more. Um, if you are rejected, do you apply again? Yes, we love people that apply again. We do note that and we, it does count towards, uh, it gives you more positive points if you're reapplying. We love resilient founders that, you know, don't give up and keep trying. So mm -hmm. please apply again. Yeah. Is program online nowadays? It is. Um, so the program is a hybrid program. So all the core elements are online over Zoom. We do have physical offices in San Francisco and also in different parts of the world. We have a, a, a logistics center in near FedEx in Tennessee, if you need to go to Memphis. Um, but in San Francisco is the hub and you have office space there if you want to use it. But we don't force this, the founders right now to all co-work from that space. So the founders will choose what they want to do. We do have two in-person retreats during the six month program. We have two four day retreats where we encourage everybody to come to San Francisco. And that's a time to bond in person with your co-founders and also network in, in the Bay Area. And then, of course, if you want to, you're more than welcome to come to the Bay Area, too, and work co-work out of San Francisco. Great. And my last question, do you have a portrait of a successful founder or founders? So I think there's a lot of different paths to success. But, I, you know, I think a portrait that I can show, I think people always ask me, what are the characteristics of the founders that succeed uh, versus those that are good but don't ultimately thrive and the, you know there have been a lot i'm also a teacher at stanford so i teach entrepreneurship in the engineering school and there's a lot of academic studies that have been done on trying to predict founder success and the big takeaway is that there's very little predictable predictability so people have done these studies on personality traits and all these different characteristics and the academic literature shows that there's only two things that correlate which i can talk about later but in my experience I think an, a good example would be Edith Harbaugh, who is the CEO of LaunchDarkly. So LaunchDarkly is a unicorn plus startup that came out of Alchemist. That It's a um, dev tool company. Um, so they do feature flags, feature flag automation. And what's amazing about Edith is, is that um, she is phenomenally grit. She has a ton of grit and um, persistence. And I think that trait is a common trait amongst our successful founders where the best founders are able to just continue to set a pace on just continuing to get things done um, without getting distracted. And they have this bifocal ability. They have a long-term vision where they understand where they're going to go in 10 years and they have, they're, they're willing to take a risk on an alternative future and stand with that with conviction. Um, but then they also know the next three things they need to get done. So they can do both. So the, the, the founders falter if they're good at one, but not the other. If they're very tactical, but they're building something that's going to be very competitive and not become something truly disruptive, or they're these huge visionaries, but the market's not going to occur for five years. And so they don't have the market timing done. And Edith was just very disciplined. As an example of that, she used to run. She was a runner. And, uh, and she still does run, I'm sure, today. But during the program, she wouldn't run like a mile or 10 miles or even a marathon. She would do century runs, which are 100-mile runs. She would run 100 miles. And 
if you know people who do these century runs, it just requires discipline and you have to just be persistent. You just have to, you're, you're just going for the long haul. And a startup is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And um, Edith wasn't the most, I would say, um, she's charismatic in her own way, but she's not the most outwardly, obviously, you know, um, uh, personality driven founder who's going to, um, who's going to win you over with style over substance. Um, but she was the most persistent. So she would always ask people at the beginning and she wasn't, she wasn't the, the top rated company at demo day. She didn't raise the most amount of money at our demo day, even though now she's raised more money than any company at Alchemist in the beginning stages, the hardest money is the initial money. And what she was great at was that she would just be relentless. She would ask everybody, Hey, I'd like you to invest in my company. Um, do you want to put money in? And she would be, for her, it was better to get a no than a maybe. And so she just kept pushing people um, to, until she got her first raises done. And then when her product started taking off, all the VCs started clamoring to get her to take their money. So I think persistence is a is is an underrated and highly correlated trait with success. And what does Stanford say to two characteristics? Oh, the two characteristics that are shown in the literature are one is if you're, there are two things that are correlated based on some studies. I think this came out of uh, an, a, a, an accounting firm that did some of this analysis was one is if your um, parents are entrepreneurs, mm. you have a higher probability of success. So, and I think the thinking there is that it normalizes risk taking. So sometimes if you're, if you come from a family that is not entrepreneurial, the idea of going into something new creates, you know, stress mm -hmm. or it's, 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 uh, it's unknown for kids of entrepreneurs. It's, they feel very comfortable, comfortable with uncertainty. And the second thing is if you're actually um, in the U S if you come from an international background, if you come, if you come outside of Silicon Valley, it's actually positively correlated. Um, and in fact, I know venture capital funds, very prominent ones where I ask them, what do I should, what should I filter for when I showcase startup founders to you? And they don't want the Silicon Valley native founders. And these are some VCs that have done heavy data science. They're not trying to be nice to our international founders. It's just that the data shows that international founders have a statistically significant advantage. So I think that's also, that also bodes well. If you think that, you know, oh, don't be self-conscious if you're not American, that's an advantage actually. Cool. Um, Ravi, thank you so much for sharing all this information with us. Thank you for so much for coming. Thank you, Olga, for having me. Um, and Olga and all of you founders are heroes. So just keep remembering that that's how the world changes is through you. So um, uh, please, uh, we, we, uh, uh, please stay on your journeys. And if you guys need any support or help, just reach out to Alchemist. And we'd love it, of course, if you guys apply too. Thank you. Thank you.